Good afternoon. So it's a pleasure to join you here at uh, COGX 2021. Uh, last time I spoke at this event, it was pouring with rain in 2019. Uh, it's been fantastic to be to spend a bit of time uh, in person in King's Cross. I look forward to uh, joining the event again later this evening. Uh, so um, talking today about production machine learning and uh, some of this will probably follow on from uh, Simon and Tim's talk from um, uh, Best Practice AI, uh, which provides a great basis for uh, leadership to understand and evaluate AI risk and governance. I'm going to be going a little bit deeper on some of the practical side of running machine learning in production. Uh, so I'm the founder and CEO of Selden. Uh, we're a London-based commercial open source scale up focusing on building MLOps tools for and infrastructure to help organizations to accelerate the adoption of AI in the enterprise. Uh, our software has been deployed, has deployed over one and a half million models and is in use globally um, across over 12,000 Kubernetes clusters. Uh, some of our customers include leaders in healthcare, finance, automotive and retail. So in this talk, I'm going to give you a high level overview of some of the important considerations uh, for, uh, for ML in production. And as I go along, please uh, feel free to ask questions in the, using the Q&A tool. Um, and uh, I'll uh, answer those questions either as, uh, as they occur or we can save some questions uh, to the end. So um, so originally, when uh, some of the earliest adopters and innovators, um, in the tech giants, uh, had, were wanted to build and deploy machine learning, they effectively built their own machine learning platforms from scratch. Uh, and this is a huge undertaking with you know, very large teams, hundreds of people to, uh, to actually build this technology to, so that they can gain a competitive advantage. So some well-cited examples, including Uber's Michelangelo, Facebook, SB Learner, and Google with uh, TFX, which is an extension of TensorFlow uh, for internal use. And uh, you know, this was a very big barrier to entry, um, but platforms started to emerge, which enabled organizations to uh, effectively put in place an end-to-end an -end machine learning platform. Uh, most of those based around the cloud, things like SageMaker uh, from AWS, CM CMLE uh, from Google, and, uh, and some startups as well. Um, many of these were focused in the early stages more on the data science side of the problem. Um, but as organizations uh, had more sophisticated requirements, uh, specialized tools also were starting to emerge, which focused on you know, a very small part of this overall um, kind of pipeline or infrastructure stack. Uh, and uh, many of these were startups really that were focusing on, on uh, you know, one specific part of this, uh, this, this, this overall um, problem. Um, also, uh, the cloud native technologies are emerging, uh, which originally were sort of taking the concept of containers uh, from Docker and, and enabling these to be orchestrated in a way to uh, allow it, make it make it much easier for organizations to manage uh, like large scale complex applications uh, at scale across clouds. Uh, and on-prem, and in doing so, uh, they can gain more control, less vendor lock-in. And we found at Selden from the early days when we founded 2014 and our first releases of our first uh, open source project uh, was really leveraging the, um, uh, or using uh, Kubernetes as the basis because containers make a fantastic kind of vehicle for managing the deployment of, uh, of machine learning models. So, um, so this is a big trend, this unbundling of the uh, of, of machine learning, right? So um, uh, as organizations, uh, decision makers within organizations are kind of making the decision, do they go down the route of a kind of end-to-end -end platform or do they go work with kind of a best of breed uh, approach where there's a little bit more effort in bringing together the different components, but the output is a little bit more uh, tailored, uh, kind of like the uh, advantages that the early adopters, um, innovators got from building their own uh, infrastructure. So according to a recent uh, O'Reilly 
uh, survey on uh, AI adoption, about a quarter of enterprises now describe themselves as mature. Um, and uh, this is um, split really across industries and, and, and geographies. Uh, so, you know, more adoption in financial services, for example, relatively less in, say, public sector and education. And uh, uh, A16Z, Andrew Andreessen Horowitz, also released a survey recently that looked at the number of models in production. Um, clearly, large enterprises are doing a lot better with about 50% uh, now have over 30 models in production. So um, what goes into um, putting machine learning models into production? Well, it's not just a data science problem. It also requires DevOps teams to collaborate. And uh, you know, both of these stakeholders uh, have you know, different skill sets, ultimately more in engineering, more sort of math background, and uh, they, they use different tools uh, as well. And uh, these uh, teams are typically siloed. I mean, organizations are doing more to bring them together, and it's something that we're working on. Uh, but especially now, even as well, with uh, you know, remote working and hybrid working being the norm, enabling these teams to collaborate effectively um, is a big priority that can reduce bottlenecks. Um, so at the moment, it takes organizations anything from about a week to six months uh, to deploy a model. Obviously, there's uh, organizations that go a lot faster and slower than that, but that's kind of the average. And uh, this, uh, you, you clearly want to be closer to one week than six months. So um, one of the roles that has emerged is the ML engineer. Uh, so this kind of unicorn has an understanding of uh, both sides of this divide, this uh, um, DevOps and data science, uh, both very deep, complex domains. Uh, so very sought after, they could command a higher average salary. Um, and uh, effectively, what we're doing at Selden is enabling data science teams to augment their skill sets of their data science team and their DevOps team so that they can effectively function uh, more like a uh, ML engineer. So uh, let's dive a little bit deeper into the workflow um, and the life cycle of a machine learning model. So uh, this is one example here. There's obviously different variations of this. But this is looking at kind of a nice uh, stages of, um, of the machine learning workflow. And uh, we're sort of mapping onto this, the you know, different uh, sort of team members that are involved along the way. Um, so um, you know, in the early stages, it really is more around managing the data, collecting the data, cleaning it, labeling, uh, data engineers passing something which is useful over to the data scientists for them to work with. And uh, uh, once the data scientist has actually built their model, uh, they hand over to the ML engineer. Uh, and once their model is in production, they'll hand over to the DevOps people. Um, throughout this entire process, it's important that the product leads are uh, engaged in the process. And uh, as the model is running in production, uh, the data scientists will need to have a uh, feedback loop to understand uh, how they can iterate and improve upon the model that's running in production. So it's not a case of just setting it and forgetting. You know, the model is a is a mod, is a dynamic thing, uh, unlike an application that you build it and it's, it'll always behave in the same way. Uh, it's important that this is something which uh, is is effectively monitored. Uh, so um, there is not just data within the model, but there is metadata uh, being generated throughout this entire process, and it's very important that this is. Uh, stored and used effectively uh, throughout. And uh, uh, what we're, uh, when you overlay the challenges around DevOps to this, the um, you can think of this sort of day zero problem um, being the, 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 the sort of trans, uh, trans, the moving from data to creating a model and a, and a model that is fit for production. The kind of process of actually productionizing the model being a day one process and then day two is really, you know, effectively the the ongoing management of that model in production for, um, you know, for 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 the, for the full life cycle of the model, which um, over time is a um, you know, is a much larger technical challenge in terms of the resources and and and, and uh, you know effort involved. Um, so, you know, what we believe really is the surface area of this uh, production stage in terms of the complexity is much larger than the kind of early stages of data um, data science, data prep, 
uh, and training. Uh, so um, this is the problem we've uh, decided to focus on at Selden and, and one that we've been working on for the last few years. So, um, so as organizations uh, adopt machine learning, you know, typically what we see is that in the early stages, uh, a smaller team uh, will uh, embark on a new project. There's a small number of users, they're very agile uh, in the way that they operate. You know, they won't be working with multiple different uh, training systems or you know, kind of model um, uh, languages and frameworks. And they're very you know, relatively like limited in the, um, restrictions um, at, at this stage. So um, you know, then once organization starts to adopt machine learning more broadly, uh, you start to find that across uh, an entire business unit, uh, you're suddenly you know, increasing the number of, uh, of models significantly um, and, and users. But at this stage, you start to find that different training systems are involved, multiple frameworks, and uh, an existing DevOps team to, in, to sort of interface with so that this remains in sync with the rest of the sort of deployment workflow uh, of the rest of the, of the um, applications and, and roadmap uh, within this group. Uh, so, you know, more uh, department level constraints and, uh, and, and privileges required. So massively amplifies the complexity. And, uh, you know, at this stage, we start to see people looking beyond the kind of manual uh, sort of packaging and, and, and serving of models using a sort of standalone model servers to wanting to have a more kind of um, robust ML platform in place that can handle uh, this uh, level of complexity. And this again is uh, kind of amplified as you move in up to the kind of organizational level uh, where really the sky's the limit. You know, you have uh, you know, hundreds or thousands of users, certainly, you know, well into the hundreds or thousands of models. You can be, you can be you know, building thousands of models per month in some cases, drug discovery, for example. Uh, then, um, you know, you might not just have multiple platforms, you may have multiple clouds, maybe sort of organizational level compliance and, and sort of high level uh, principles to consider. Uh, so, um, you know, this is, you know, one of the, 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 this is really where having a very sort of standardized infrastructure for production can really um, accelerate the kind of adoption of machine learning within an, within an organization. If, if you have multiple different systems spread across, uh, it can massively slow down um, uh, innovation. So, you know, here are some of the uh, production machine learning challenges. Uh, that are particularly hard to uh, uh, to achieve at scale. Uh, so we're going to talk through each of these: uh, orchestration, uh, monitoring, explainability, and governance. Uh, and we'll kind of cover some of the kind of underlying arch architectural patterns that we use at Selden for each of these, uh, which are developed with scale in mind uh, and are designed to work efficiently across hundreds or thousands of heterogeneous machine learning models. Um, so um, we won't go super deep into the um, uh, into each of these architectural patterns, but I encourage you to connect with the team at Selden for a deeper dive on, on any of these. Um, we'll be kicking off as well in each of these with a kind of quick high-level case study uh, and then sort of breaking it apart and, uh, and building it back up. Okay, so um, first orchestration at, at scale. So, you know, how do we manage um, more complex requirements for uh, multiple models or more complex kind of model architectures uh, for um, uh, that take into consideration monitoring, governance, et cetera. Uh, so um, uh, one of the uh, users we have of uh, Selden Core is uh, Capital One. And uh, they uh, built a internal system called um, Model as a Service. And this uses our open source project, Selden Core. And so what they're looking to do is accelerate the time to market of ML models uh, enable this uh, you know, lower barrier of entry so that developers can get their models into production themselves, um, or data scientists, and then to um, enable the uh, increased operational efficiencies and, and, uh, and achieve economies of scale. So through working with open source software, they were able to put in place an, an MVP that in less than 90 days, uh, when otherwise it, uh, it, it would have taken a, a, a lot longer to, uh, to to build this uh, from scratch, bring it all together. Uh, so this is also working in a custom system that they've built in house, um, and uh, it's, it's designed specifically for their requirements. So um, you know, this is a big trend we're generally seeing 
within more sophisticated organizations is they have a an AI platform project and team that are working on bringing together components to solve these challenges. Uh, so in this case, uh, a direct director of product management um, has said that this has, has uh, reduced the time taken to deploy from months to minutes, which is obviously a you know business changing um, uh, level of uh, of progress. So um, so to break this apart, like why do we why not just wrap my models in Flask? So Flask is a uh, it's kind of a lightweight uh, uh, project which allows uh, developers, data scientists to create effectively a server. Um, it's um, uh, very lightweight and um, uh, it's so, uh, you know, it, it can work quite well. Um, but um, it's once you then move into um, the more sophisticated requirements, uh it can start to uh lead to a, a lot of more manual work when you have no no lineage no auditability you know none of the features that um uh that so uh, that, that are part of a uh sort of modern uh ml platform and so this can you know provide can save time at the start but lead to a lot more efforts uh further down the line okay so this may be good in the kind of initial kind of MVP stage, uh, but beyond that, uh, to achieve scale, uh, you basically need to uh, provide a standardized way for abstracting some very complex concepts into some standardized infrastructure. So, um, uh, what we, what you see here is uh, an example of a simple inference graph at the top. Uh, in this case, a single model uh, is, has been packaged up and effectively converted into a microservice, which can be uh, handed over to a developer to integrate within the application. Uh, so, in in effect, quite similar to um, to Flask. Um, but what you see below is uh, is what we call an inference graph. So in this case, rather than just packaging up a single model, an organization is packaging up multiple models, model A, B, and C in this case, and they've put that model behind a multi-arm bandit. And what this is doing is testing each of those models to see which one is performing best, and then kind of pushing the request towards the one that's performed best. You then have a feature transformer uh, to uh, change the data as it's coming through the system. Uh, this can be a custom component, which is created, handcrafted by the uh, by the by the by the data science team. You then have uh, two two uh, monitoring components: uh, outlier detection and an adversarial detection. So, you know, checking for anomalies, checking if the model is being attacked. Uh, so, this is a completely custom. Uh, uh, well, it can be completely customized, and uh, this. Uh, is something which can be then version controlled and managed in its own right. So just as you would manage a single model, you can manage an entire inference graph and, and version control it. And um, in each of these cases, each of these models can um, uh, could, can be connected to uh, any one of the, the leading uh, uh, ML libraries, uh, scikit-learn, TensorFlow, XGBoost, uh anything pytorch or, or you can create your own custom wrappers for uh that, that are available for any of the um uh software languages so it's uh yeah fully customizable uh so um so so actually when you're running a model on something like uh, tf serving uh it will be slightly more optimized for tensorflow models for example and so we recognize that's the case and we do actually uh, enable models to be uh, sort of deployed still uh, within this uh, within this inference graph concept on a optimized model server that is um, and designed for that framework. So uh, this um, enables a much more optimized performance, but still the flexibility uh, to run across multiple different uh, environments. So um, we um, uh, in, in, this this is something which is possible within the open source product. What you see on the 
uh, left here is an example of, of our enterprise product, Seldon Deploy, uh, which provides kind of a, a um, more of a deployment wizard in this case, uh, which uh, uh, takes you through each of the different steps to deploy a model. So there's no uh, hand coding of uh, Kubernetes uh, custom resources, YAML, et cetera. Uh, it's something which is uh, you know, much easier to uh, uh, to use out of the box. So, um, uh, and this is really kind of you know the work, the, the direction of of travel for a lot of the workflows is to take it out of is to kind of abstract away some of the complexity, and to make it much more accessible to uh, people that so that they can focus on their core uh, challenges. So, uh, so moving up a level in terms of the kind of enterprise infrastructure, there's various different subsystems, data source uh, at play, um, and, uh, and and repos. So. Um, uh, the first, if you look at the um, uh, the pink uh, sort of area, uh, data scientists are using their preferred environment for models, for building models and, and experimentation. Uh, in this case, they'll be uh, maybe still working within notebooks, for example. And uh, the output of this, uh, they basically putting into a, uh, a, a sort of managed workflow, uh, leveraging continuous integration. ETL pipelines, you know, seldom we use Jenkins, but there are other examples like Circle CI, GitHub Actions. And uh, then we want to manage the rollout of these models into production. Uh, so we're configuring then things like uh, uh, the resources that are available, uh, auto scaling rules. Um, and, um, and it's really important that everything that's been done in this environment is auditable and reproducible. Uh, so, um, uh, we're working with uh, metadata store. Uh, so basically along the way, all of the metadata associated with the models is available uh, for audit uh, and also just available so that uh, to make the life of the data scientist and an and, and ML engineer easier so they can you know, dive into the model catalog, they can search and query to find the models that they uh, want to deploy. And we also uh, work with a concept called uh, a, a tool called GitOps or Git, um, and, a, and a methodology uh, which is now known as, as GitOps, which effectively enables organizations to manage their deployment via uh, Git. So if you uh, commit a new, an update to Git, this will uh, trigger a um, a new model to be rolled out, for example. So this uh, is kind of known. The trend is known as kind of declarative infrastructure, and it's you know huge, and uh, you know, very very much recommend diving into that and and uh, and adopting this as, as an approach. Uh, so um, uh, yeah, to complete the loop, really, there's we had there's a there's a kind of um, feedback loop from the inference stage back into the uh, system, so that data scientists can work through their next phase of uh, experimentation. So. Um, we um we have talked through like one of the uh uh systems for uh testing models in production so uh this also was used for you know applications things like facebook when they're testing a uh a new uh shade of blue on their um on on their uh like button or or, or another uh, you know, UI interface, rather than rolling it out to everybody at once, they'll just roll it out to a very small uh, portion of traffic, see how it performs, and then decide whether to do a rolling update. So, you know, we use the same kind of methodology for machine learning. And uh, this uh, enables you to first create a, uh, a model or to you know, deploy a model and uh, set your auto, auto scaling rules. And then we'll, we'll create a, a canary. So the canary is carving out in this case, 10% of traffic, it could be less or more, uh, but um, we then can uh, just test that to see how it's working. And if we wanted to, we could just re remove this uh, uh, this canary um, if it's not working, or we can promote it. So in this case, this new Onyx model, uh, we're realizing is, uh, is, 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 is working more effectively. We do some more advanced deep learning with it, and it's, uh, it has better accuracy and uh, and so we're promoting that to 100% of the traffic. Uh, at this step, step, we may realize we've made a mistake. So we want to revert this back to the original uh, scikit-learn model. Uh, so um, 
this is, is a process which may cause uh, sort of downtime or delays issues, but leveraging GitOps in a sort of robust uh, kind of ML deployment platform enables you to kind of run these kind of workflows without uh, you know, worrying and enabling uh, other members of the team to, or broader members of the team to, um, to be part of this workflow. So uh, kind of final point for now on, on, on orchestration, uh, data or de DevOps and, and ML engineers typically um, have more uh, engagement with production machine learning tools. So, uh, you know, they're the ones that uh, have, I suppose, been trusted with running uh, live production systems and data scientists are kind of more in the R and D phase, and it's you know they're, they're not they're, they're designed to kind of do the uh, more cutting edge re research and to and, and to effectively uh, you know focus in in that area and 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 for the kind of uh, uh, robust and uh, sort of infrastructure and guardrails to be put in place by the by the DevOps team, um, but really like there's a big trend now towards engaging the data science team more um, in that sort of production process with the kind of tools that they uh that they're familiar with and uh and want to use right so uh in this case we've we've um just released a new open source project at seldom called tempo and uh effectively what it provides is a mlops sdk uh for data scientists so it's based around python it's written in python so obviously uh can be integrated with uh, uh other Data science components and 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 and, and, and libraries. Um, it uh, gives access to uh, uh, running and executing uh, deploy core um, and uh, KF serving, which is another uh, model server that we've been uh, collaborating on at uh, Selden, and uh, it's fully extensible as well. So it could be used in in, in other cases. We um, uh, you can also then build out your business logic. In Python as well, uh, connected to that kind of um, orchestration logic, which we showed, uh, which I showed earlier. So, um, please, yeah, check it out. We'd love to get feedback. This is a relatively new uh, project from Seldon. We're, we're, we're super excited by it. Okay, so to move on to monitoring at scale, uh, we um, first of all just to dive into the case study again. So, uh, this is one we're super proud of at Seldon, and actually, funnily enough, this is one of the things about open source. We only heard about it like a few months after it happened. Uh, so, um, uh, but this is a case study between Microsoft and, and, and Philips. And uh, basically during COVID-19, as, as, as you're all aware, uh, there was a, this incredible challenge uh, where uh, ICUs were uh, at potential of hitting capacity. And uh, this was forcing, uh, medical practitioners, hospitals, et cetera, to make difficult decisions um, around uh, you know, this, this very precious resource uh, and, and, and to try to optimize the patient health uh, outcome. Uh, so what they did is built a model uh, which is uh, informed uh, by this continuous collection of biometric and clinical data uh, you know, to help inform their decision-making. Uh, and uh, and so, you know, based upon this, they can uh, they, they they can uh, uh, figure out uh, how to best allocate the resources. And so, you know, so the big challenge here is that this is a is a critical use case. You know, people's lives are on the line, and uh, uh, this this model is you know there to save lives, uh, but it's um, uh, it's also very time intensive and, and computationally expensive to train uh, the model. Uh, so you need to figure out what's the optimal timing for uh, kind of, uh, of, of, of the timing for actually updating, train, retraining the model and testing the performance to make sure that the, any, you're catching any changes to the model performance, uh, which uh, could impact the outputs. So um, you know, they were looking for this scalable solution uh, they work with Microsoft on the case. They obviously work through Azure, uh, which is obviously a fantastic cloud, um, and uh, and our friends at Databricks. Uh, and uh, what we were just you know super blown away by is is that this is a project which integrated Alibi Detect 
uh, which is one of our open source uh, projects focusing on um, model monitoring. So it provides um, a set of algorithms focusing on things like uh, drift detection, uh, explainability, and um, uh, sorry, uh, an outlier, drift detection, outlier detection, adversarial uh, attack detection. So uh, uh, in this case, just to explain, explain a level deeper, the um, what they're what they're aiming to do is to check if the data has gone out of sync, the training data has gone out of sync with the live data that's going through the system. So this is a drift detection uh, case study. So these are some of these uh, the examples of um, monitoring, uh, which ultimately is there to enable organizations to make a proactive uh, decision rather than being reactive. Uh, so um, you know, there's different kind of dimensions of this. Uh, so you know, many of you will have experience in application monitoring, which is more focused on tracking errors and, and service availability. Uh, and so, you know, for the un in uninitiated, it may sound quite similar. Um, and uh, as we've been focusing more and more on this problem at Selden, it, uh, it really is kind of an or order of magnitude greater. Um, so you have the live data flowing through the system, the, it's con which is continually changing. There's this unpredictability of the model and the output. Um, and uh, uh, and so, uh, and, and the nature of, of ML uh, applications, so uh, you know, based around models, uh, which are effectively the application, uh, and 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 the, and the models are in, in in high performance systems. There's typically you know hundreds or thousands of models across many different use cases, live streaming data. So yeah, it's a very big challenge. Uh, so. Uh, first of all, in terms of service metrics, uh, what we're looking here is is, is actually really the um, uh, utilization of the resources. You know, uh, the people running machine learning uh, at scale will find that they, they suddenly start to get very large uh, compute bills from their from their cloud or as they're building up their data center. And actually, it's very important to monitor this and optimize this. Uh, so on this one level. Um, we can enable organizations to me measure their service metrics, both in terms of the kind of compute costs, but also uh, to enable them to uh, meet their uh, SLAs associated with uh, kind of response times, measuring latency, request per second, et cetera. Uh, so we have an architectural pattern for this. As I said, I won't go into the details on it, but we're leveraging tools like Prometheus, Elastic, um, and uh, uh, the kind of ELK stack, so yeah, Elasticsearch, Logstash, Kibana. Um, and uh, then onto statistical monitoring. So in this case, it's about like, can it, how does uh, ML actually impact your business KPIs? So um, uh, the, uh, there's, a, there's a concept of a custom metric uh, within Seldom Core, and you can use this to provide, to extend the kind of, uh, metadata that, that you're, you're collecting and, and, and monitoring and then, and then you, you are able to then uh, provide a feedback loop so in the case of a uh, model uh, having an, uh, some some impact upon a uh, external application uh, like say you've recommended something you may want to see whether someone has then gone on to purchase it later and you could feed that back into the system uh, so um, uh, this so uh, yeah, it's, it's obviously critical for actually displaying, uh, displaying models for uh, business uh, stakeholders and sort of proving the, the value. Then there's um, outlier detection. Uh, so if outliers are you know, not acted upon, they can have a negative impact on the business. Uh, it obviously depends upon the use case, how serious this is. Uh, and uh, detecting outliers enables you to kind of uh, diagnose, you figure out where, where you should be looking, uh, data scientists should be looking um, to sort of uh, improve models, uh, to, to check for errors, and uh, you know, focus on the issues that are most important. Uh, in some cases, you may want to trigger a manual process at this point, like a human in the loop, uh, to or sort of a manual validation step uh, based upon the use case. And uh, uh, we um, we have this integrated in, uh, into Alibi Detect, our uh, open source library, uh, the you know, collection of different uh, algorithms. Uh, but we've also integrated it into, into the sort of fully fledged enterprise uh, product, uh, just to sort of tie it all together, provide more visual output. Uh, so um, then we have Drift. Okay, so um, uh, as I said earlier, this relates back to the uh, 
the Microsoft example, the ICU example. Uh, so yeah, over time, the the, the uh, the data, live data goes out of uh, out of sync with the training data. So this example here, you see these uh, uh, images on the top uh, right, different uh, data sets, uh, each containing uh, bananas, and these have different styles associated with them. So if you trained on one of these, and then you feed in another data set and ask it to classify, uh, it, it's, it's not going to work so well. And and uh, and so, um, you know, this, this is effectively the way of... Uh, uh, measuring uh, this level of drift uh, and, and this, uh, which it leads to inaccuracies, and uh, and then you, there are techniques which then enable you to um, uh, to identify which, which um, where, where there are maybe gaps in the data. Uh, so you can you can sort of you know focus your efforts on labeling, for example. An example you see in the um, bottom right here, um, the um, to show just you know how how this can can also be an, another sort of very serious uh, lead to very serious consequences if it's not uh, sort of uh, looked into uh, and, and managed. Uh, the um, uh, th these are different samples uh, uh, you have taken in, in, in hospitals uh, working on looking for uh, cancers, and so these are different uh, uh, tumors. Which basically, if they um, uh, in, they're trained on one on, on one set of hospitals. But then the te if the test is then done in an another hospital, uh, it might just be something as simple as the the ink that's used on the sample coming from a slightly different vendor for that to throw off this uh, um, example. So um, or throw off the results. So it's um, yeah something which is it must play a, a fundamental part in uh, in the live production monitoring system. So um, the so, so one of the challenges in drift detection is uh, the you know you don't get all the data at once. The data arrives in sequence, uh, and you need to be able to detect the drift uh, as soon as early as possible. So uh, you can you know detect it at a point where uh, it's uh, it's not a uh, just a, a regular statistical variation, um, but but something which genuinely is. The data drifting, and that's a really big technical challenge uh, that our data scientists have spent a lot of time working on. Um, and there's various different strategies for uh, working with this. And also consider it this is like an, usually an ongoing uh, feed uh, over, over uh, of input over over a long period of time. So there's you know, strategies for breaking that apart into you know, different windows of the time to make sure that that is is, is also scalable as well. So. Um, uh, yeah, detecting drift enables you to improve your performance and reduce costs, uh, and uh, you know uh, ensure uh, avoid uh, negative uh, outcomes. So explainability, obviously, a huge uh, topic and one that's you know, hotly debated, discussed. Uh, so um, we uh, you know see this as really going hand in hand with monitoring and and uh, you know critical part of uh, of running ML in production. So quick case study. Uh, one of our clients was um, you know, building, uh, well, well, one of our clients in the insurance space, Kavir, um, was um, uh, building models uh, that, that help them to make uh, decisions uh, in the insurance space. And uh, uh, before they were leveraging explainability, uh, some of the most advanced algorithms that were looking great in terms of the performance in an offline setting could not be deployed into production. Uh, after uh, making these models explainable, they're actually able to uh, make improvements uh, in critical areas such as claim autom automation, payments processing, um, and they were able to actually realize the value. So, you know, kind of the key point being that explainability enables uh, organizations, but in, more so in, in kind of regulated industries as well, to uh, to, to actually uh, unlock the value, the true value that that machine learning can bring. So to kind of go back to break this apart, uh, first, you know, ML models, as I'm sure you're aware, um, are effectively a black box. So um, when they have been trained, uh, the the rules effectively that uh, uh, that are generated inside. The model through that training stage, uh, you know, pushing vast amounts of data through the algorithm, uh, creates something which uh, logic, which is isn't interpretable for humans. And there's basically a trade-off between interpretability and performance. So, you know, 
handcrafted rules are interpretable but will not provide the same level of performance as say some deep learning uh sort of multi-layer neural network uh so um you know, so this is what we're trying to solve uh so you know why would we do this so you know enables organizations to uh, build trust um and uh wouldn't it be frustrating if uh you know after actually deploying your model uh, uh, uh that um well actually building the model that you couldn't that you couldn't actually deploy it into production uh so uh as in the case we mentioned earlier so uh you know while uh well, about 40 percent of machine learning of um, ceos believe ai has it will have a material impact on their business um uh this so uh, uh technology is not widely used yet uh in, in in finance functions and so uh from a 2018 gartner enterprise survey they were saying this kind of fear of the unknown uh which includes the ability to understand ai and, and its related risks uh is really one of the biggest blockers so uh actually 60 percent of respondents in that particular survey uh usually uh, uh do not trust the ai techniques and are not ready to use them at this stage and so this uh explainability enables organizations to kind of uh, mitigate those, those, those challenges uh, those, uh, you know, by building trust, enabling transparency, uh, enabling organizations to check for bias. Um, and, it's, and, 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 and it also has a kind of practical use within the process as well. So data scientists are able to actually understand uh, how the models uh, are actually functioning, uh, from what's have actually been built. Um, and actually, you can either create a, um, uh, an explanation of the model as a whole, or uh, in terms of a, a global explanation or a local explanation of a particular request. Uh, so yeah, it enables you to uh, avoid damages to business reputation uh, and, and meet regulatory requirements. And these are two obviously things which are uh, big priorities outside of the data science team. And so, you know, uh, uh members of the leadership team the management around uh uh the, the, the ml platform and the business as a whole uh should be taking paying attention to this so um uh well what is an explanation so there is basically, basically there's different types of explanations so i've just mentioned a second ago this scope being local or global uh you can have like a black box model um as i mentioned earlier but white box model actually will give you access to the um uh to the model itself um and and, and actually in, in some cases the training data which can help uh, to provide a more accurate explanation um there's different types of, of tasks that provided you know, which require a different explanation and uh whether you, you can explain a an image some text you know if an nlp output um these uh you know, different data types will require different explanation and uh and, and what how do you want to explain so in, in other words um uh there are there are different algorithms which provide a different output and i'll cover these a couple of these examples in the following slides so uh anchors very popular uh is built by uh some uh, uh people in academia who uh, originally were creators of the the lime uh, uh library and uh, this is kind of the next iteration of that. And this is kind of one of the more, most popular uh, explainability uh, algorithms. So what it's doing is very simply uh, weighting the features uh, that um, providing a feature weighting, which um, uh, if, the, if those features are in place, then it will always, um, these, these features have to be in place for a prediction to hold. So in this case, with an image, uh, these uh, the kind of eyes and nose of the cat. If this is if this is in place in, within this image, it will always uh, classify as a as a cat. Um, another example here is is counterfactuals. So kind of the cl classic um, uh, case in this uh, here is where a um, you want to you want to predict what you want to change uh, to get a desired outcome. So let's say um, a loan was declined uh you'd be able to be able to tell the applicant what they would need to change on their application uh to get a, a it approved uh is is the is the is the kind of the output here so uh there are many other different cases but this is a is something which 
provides a different type of user experience and, and is useful in different scenarios. Uh, so actually, we um, at Selden have um, sort of built upon uh, some of some fantastic work um, from Sarah Wachter uh, on um, uh, counterfactual explanations. Uh, she's from uh, University of Oxford, and uh, we've we've released two um, uh, research papers uh, around this. One counterfactuals guided by prototypes, and the other one, uh, very recently, actually last week, um, is a counterfactual technique based around reinforcement learning. Uh, which uh, is highly scalable and uh, is, is available on, on, on archive. Uh, so uh, which explainer should we use? So um, we have a uh, the library Alibi Explain. Uh, it provides some documentation. If you go to docs.selden.io, this is one of the tables that you can see on there. And, and based upon the, the type of model you're using, uh, the type of scope and, and what type of um, uh data and 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 and, and classifier or, or or ml output you're looking for you can just you can figure out which algorithms you should be looking at uh so yes as you can see there's no silver bullet you know, no no one size fits all and um uh basically the, when we started looking into this space uh there, we saw there's a really well a big need for like a very well tested and pr proven um sort of production ready um set of, of algorithms uh, that are easy for data scientists to integrate uh, within their projects, and and really building the, in this in this in house is an extremely large um, R and D overhead, and much of the research that was available and what we've been you know working with is is, is you know pretty early stage, quite brittle, not yet fit for production. So um, you know a big part of the, beyond the research and figuring out how it works is to um, is to make it you know production ready. So this is you know an example of of how easy it is to then integrate an explanation into um uh in, into a project so you know taking a um uh a model that has been trained and uh and, and plugging in into this uh um uh in, in, in into this uh uh Function a uh, the predict and the and the features uh, prediction predict function and the feature names and uh, and, and outputting explanation via um, uh, in this case it's a, it's a Python um, uh, just just outputting the, the 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 data in JSON but this can be integrated within uh, an application or um, you know just just surfaced within a Jupyter notebook. Uh, so uh, we at Selden have then integrated this into um, uh, our Selden core model server uh, and also it's part of the KF serving model server. So the ex explanation, uh, because it's a slightly more com computationally heavy thing, it's not actually something which goes into an inference graph. It typically sits side by side, uh, kind of a sidecar and uh, enables you to, uh, so, so, so we, we sort of configure uh, the uh, the kind of inference graph or the, the um, uh, the, you know, for the, the deployment to actually uh, connect uh, your explainer to the model when it's running in production. And you can switch out different explainers uh, as you wish. And, uh, and, and I'm sort of bringing this together uh, when you're monitoring uh, systems, as I showed a few examples earlier, say, for example, you have an outlier, you may want to sit then figure out like, why did that outlier occur? So diving into an explanation is, 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 is very useful in this case. So you can actually um, interpret uh, and, and provide some feedback uh, on, on the model. And uh, get, taking it from this kind of Python-based output that I showed earlier into something which is more visual is one of the things that we've been working through over the last year. And really, um, depending on the model, depending on the use case, there's different types of kind of data visualization that would be required here. And making that accessible, not just to data scientists, is really key. So uh, we'll just dive in now to governance at scale. So um, to sort of set the scene here, you know, the world is really becoming much more dependent on machine learning across industries and uh, geographies, from drug discovery to improving crop yields, uh, fraud detection. Um, but this dynamic nature of ML uh, trained on large data sets means that models don't always behave in ways that are intended. Um, or they can reinforce existing biases or prevent uh, present new security or privacy uh, challenges. Um, so um, yeah, the, it's important that the the, the world moves uh, out of this R and D phase 
uh, with care and uh, uh, you know, how we go about ultimately deploying ML over the next few years will determine if we have actually made a net positive effect, uh, not just on your business, but upon society as, your whole, as a whole. Um, so, um, you know, with this in mind, uh, it's actually been quite staggering the, the amount of um, different strategies that have been emerging at national levels. Uh, and this actually is going back a few years as well. So uh, uh, you can see that we had the, for example, in, the U, in, in 2018, the AI sector deal. And, um, uh, and so whilst there has been a, you know, a number of different uh, strategies emerging, um, there, there has been started to be some kind of um, uh, uh, consensus around some of the overarching priorities around uh, AI ethics and, and, and governance. So uh, these uh, you know, principles then need to map into the policies and then the policies then need to map into the infrastructure. And, uh, and so this you know, goes from a kind of ethical societal kind of uh, 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 ethical debate into you know, how do we um, convert this into a technology infrastructure and blueprint that we can actually scale up uh, as, we've, as we're rolling out ML into production. Uh, so many of you will have uh, read about the AI, you know, the EU AI regulation, um, which is currently in a draft form. So it's been produced for a first reading at the EU. Uh, and it's going to take a little while to kind of uh, ping pong between councils and have a few more iterations. Um, but it seems to be going pretty fast, uh, all things considered. So um, uh, the, uh, the time span, uh, according to uh, some uh, advisors in the legal space who, who uh, uh, know a lot more than me about this this, this part of the topic, uh, expect about a two year time span. So uh, it's something which organizations need to start thinking about uh, right now, uh, especially if uh, you're working on any use cases which could be classified as high risk, such as autonomous driving. Uh, and there are some cases which will be completely ruled out like mass social scoring. So um, you know, the emphasis is on trustworthy AI and um, the, the, once the systems are all brought together and you're actually applying machine learning in, a, in an applied use case, this is really where um, uh, this, uh, uh, this, this regulation will, will apply. Uh, so, um, the, the kind of monitoring of AI systems once they're for continued compliance is, is it will be will be essential to um, to comply with this regulation. So um, moving on to sort of a, another another kind of effort, and this is uh, you know more around principles uh, than than policy. Uh, this kind of comes from um, the Linux Foundation, which has a group called the LFAI uh, and Data now and. Uh, What's great about this is it's obviously a, a well-established, trusted open source organization. Uh, it's been around for a long time. It has the biggest projects like Linux in it, obviously, in, in, in LF um, and uh, in LFAI. They have some you know, great uh, other projects uh, like Onyx, for example. Um, and uh, the, 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 the companies that have actually been involved in this process, uh, creating these principles, uh, include some of the kind of uh, top tech giants across five uh, continents, um, and that's really great. You know, we're not we're not just talking about a small clique within one country, but you know, a great global effort uh, across east and west, uh, and and larger tech companies as well as smaller ones. So, you know, I'm very proud that uh, Selden uh, has been part of this process, uh, specifically uh, Alejandro uh, Sosido, our ML engineering director, who is a real thought leader in this space. So they've come up up with eight. Uh, principles for trusted AI, and um, uh, this is a really great starting point for organizations thinking about like how do I map my roadmap uh, to, um, uh, to to these um, to these principles. So you know, as we're building out the technology at Selden, what we're looking at is um, you know, how can we solve these? How can we solve these ethical challenges through our features as well? So if you take something like say, you know enabling our metadata store enables better reproducibility or having um, kind of role-based access control enables better security uh, or you could have sort of you know differential privacy that uh, enables uh, you know better uh, privacy protection so uh, and we're not by the way working on that just now we but there's a fantastic project called open mind uh, which was working in in sort of privacy preserving AI so um 
so yeah, you know, this kind of um, uh, uh, this, this this process is really ultimately about going from uh, principles and regulation through to um, uh, mapping these onto kind of your, uh, 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 your your infrastructure and uh, and and, and, your, and your code ultimately and uh, uh, and so this uh, I'll give give you a couple of examples of uh, things we've been working on recently uh, uh, which. Uh, you know, help in, in, in this area. Obviously, there's, there's many different parts to this. So the model metadata store, so yeah, enables uh, better governance, auditing, and discoverability of models, um, better risk management. Uh, it can be used by members of the data science team uh, or uh, auditors uh, to check the model history connected to a um, kind of metadata store. And uh, the uh, reproducibility with GitOps, so enable the sort of code repository and the training of, um, uh, of ML models to, uh, to be packaged up in a, in a sort of central object store, something like an S3, uh, which um, uh, can then be passed into, uh, when, when you create your inference graph and you created the definition, that declarative infrastructure, that can then be fed into your GitOps uh, production repo. And, uh, and this enables you to roll back reproduce any of the different uh, ml uh not just models but you can reproduce the entire infrastructure at this stage so you can be very confident that you're going to get the same output from the models at this case so um this is an example of kind of what it looks like from a kind of uh, end user perspective with the with the um uh seldom deploy system so we have kind of a diff here that's showing the the, the change between uh the uh the previous uh, deployment and the new deployment okay so to sort of wrap up the few final thoughts here so you know people here at cogx uh are practitioners that are kind of in the you know, the very top percentile of, of people that are working in this space at this time uh obviously it's a very fast moving uh market but really it's kind of the uh practitioners uh at this stage um really have a kind of big uh resp responsibility uh to to get this right um and uh and so uh this is not just something for you know people in the data science team but really all the way through organizations uh so um uh there is a um increased uh opportunity to democratize uh through commercial open source and some fantastic cloud native tools that have become av available that make this uh, uh a lot more accessible and a lot faster for organizations to uh, not just deploy machine learning at scale, but to, to do it in a, in a more responsible way. Um, uh, but before sort of going down that, 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 that rabbit hole, you can take the time to engage uh, members of your team around um, responsible AI and the principles and, and, and how your roadmap uh, maps onto this. Uh, so if you're interested in continuing the discussion with members of the Seldom team, uh, please do connect with us at this event. Uh, I'll be there in person a little bit later today. Uh, I can drop in tomorrow. We have members of the uh, Seldom team at our virtual booth. And uh, we encourage you to speak with them and uh, to set up a, uh, a trial uh, so you can uh, get access to uh, our enterprise tools. Our open source tools are freely available for you to download as well. So, so check out Core and Alibi, Seldom Core and, and Alibi Explain and Alibi Detect. And uh, yes, this is the um, end of my presentation. So thank you very much for everyone who's tuned in. Uh, really appreciate that. And uh, I'm very happy to take a, a quick question or two via the Q&A feature. Otherwise, please do reach out. Uh, you can contact me at alex at seldom.io as well, or hello at seldom uh, and for the team. And, uh, and I, mean, I wish you all a very great rest of the day. I have one question that came in from um, uh, Neha. And she was asking if we get the slides afterwards. Yes, uh, I can make the slides available. Uh, the video, I believe, will also be available for a replay. Um, but yes, we can make the slides available as well. OK, so on that note, I don't see any, any other further questions. I see some people online. But I uh, just want to wish you all a fantastic evening uh, and, uh, and, and enjoy the rest of COGX. OK, bye for now. <laughs>